First, thank you, Scott, for inviting me. And uh, delighted you all to join us. I hope it's going to be relaxed and an informative evening. Uh, I think I would say overall, I'd like to see this as a kind of two-part evening. The first is more of a formal presentation and then a more informal time. I've talked a couple of times in the last year about the dimensions of power. And when I was talking with Scott about this, he said, you ought to see how it uh, applies in New York City. So that's the overall uh, kind of story of why we're here this evening. As you're aware from what Scott has just said, it's been years from the end of 69, 73 in the White House as Henry Kissinger's assistant. It was a time in U.S. history, which some of you will remember, of significant international developments, and at the same time, domestic turmoil. The country was in the middle of the Vietnam War. There was great domestic division. There was Watergate. We were negotiating the Strategic Arms Imitation Treaty with the Soviet Union, pursuing Middle East shuttle diplomacy, and it was the secret opening to China. It's from this perspective that I want to address political power in its broadest sense, whether legitimately or illegitimately attained or exercised by individuals or organizations, by state or non-state actors. And finally, whether the states are liberal democracies or non-democratic authoritarian regimes. In other words, all forms of political power. But first, I must stress that this is the result of reflecting on my time in the White House over many years, and probably the most lasting memory is that of a sense of battle. And not a military battle, but a sense of battle between uh, strategic negotiators at some forum somewhere, or even an economic battle between uh, different commercial states, with a sense of battle unseen and supernatural. Hence the title, The Dimensions of Power. And I'll address it at two levels, which I just said, first in terms of the sweep of history, and then what does it mean for you here, day to day, in New York? History is a chronology of the exercise of power, and I propose that throughout history there have been three dimensions of power. First, as Scott's already mentioned, there is the hard power dimension. <coughs> this is the tangible dimension. How many men are in your armed forces? How many guns, weapons, bombs, drones, tanks, missiles, aircraft, etc., 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 do you have? That's pretty straightforward, not controversial. It can be measured, and there it is. Then there's the soft power dimension, which has become popular in recent years, and uh, how different nations use their soft power. And it's uh, much has been written about it. It's kind of the sum total of the strategy of your intelligence network, of your counterintelligence capacity, of your logistical systems, your diplomacy, your propaganda, economic power, cultural influence, etc., etc. It is there. You can see it. We know nations jockey for position around the use of their soft power. And today we even include use of the social media and cyber warfare. In sum, Soft power guides how and what you do with your hard power. Now, in addition to those two, I'm convinced there's a third dimension of power. You can call it the non-hard, non-soft dimension. It's not tangible, it's not intellectual, it's not plans or strategy or intelligence. You can call it, as I just said, non-hard, non-soft. I've called it the spiritual dimension. It leads to wars of the spirit, battles between good and evil, unseen, supernatural. It determines actually how hard and soft power are used. But we, human beings, are not in control of it. Let me illustrate this idea by looking at one of the most interesting analyses of political power, I think, 
in my lifetime done about uh, 15 years ago in a documentary called Fog of War, 11 Lessons from the Life of Robert McNamara. Let me first ask, how many people have seen Fog of War? Okay, that's the first takeaway from tonight, which is I think you can get it on Netflix. I think, I think it's the most uh, trenchant and, and powerful critique uh, of our society, uh, uh, certainly that I've ever seen. McNamara, most of you know, was Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and then Johnson. He was before that at the World Bank, before that he ran Ford Motor Company, before that he was in the Second World War. And he went around after he was through all those things and went to all the people he had negotiated with around the world to try and figure out what went right and what went wrong. Uh, it won the Academy Award in 2003, the Oscar, and today it's actually part of the uh, mandatory program in the intelligence training community in Washington. So try and get to see it. I'm gonna give you a 30 second or three minute summary. Three of McNamara's lessons relate to hard power. Those are maximize efficiency, proportionality should be a guide and work. Three, get the data. And three more of his 11 relate to soft power. Emphasize, em, em, empathize with your adversary. Rationality will not save us. And never say never. But there are five that are neither hard nor soft. Namely, there's something beyond oneself. Belief and seeing are often both wrong. Be prepared to re-examine your reasoning and your assumptions. In order to do good, you may have to engage in evil. You can't change human nature. McMire was in his 80s when he did this film, or agreed to be interviewed in this film. And when they finished it, they came up with the title because there was so much there. And each one of those lessons that I've just listed is in a sense documented and drops out of his own experience. History, as I said, is a chronology of the exercise of power other than which we put in a big category, say, act of God, those things that happen that no human has anything to say about. And my wife is always reminding me that a good example of that is when I came home one night from the White House and we had been working very hard to set up a major summit in the Middle East between the President Nixon and the uh, <coughs> President of uh, Egypt at that time, Abdel Nasser. And in the middle of all the preparations, just as everybody was getting ready to announce it, Nasser died. No summit, no trip, nothing. But everything totally changed, the whole equation of everything that was going on in the Middle East. So I want to make sure that that's the first recognition that these things happen that nobody has anything to say about. But other than that, if you look back through history, there are recorded events. Events don't happen on their own. They happen because of human action or human inaction. And sometimes, and all times, there's probably a chance of having a good decision and a bad decision. So that's driven by human nature. And people exercise that power. People make these events happen. What kind of people? People whose nature is just like yours and mine. So it's important to understand first human nature and have a realistic view of what motivates and drives the people who are in power and exercise their authority, and out of that comes the events. So now I just want to set out some quotes to set the stage for the spiritual dimension of power, spiritual dimension of human nature. I'm going to get a glass here. Many 
many of you will know the quote from Alexander Solzhenitsyn's classic work, The Gulag Archipelago. Gradually it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states, not between classes, nor between political parties either, but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. This line shifts inside us and oscillates with the years. And even within hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good is retained. And even in the best of hearts, there is a small bridge, bridgehead of evil, one small corner. It is impossible to expel evil from the world in its entirety, but it is possible to constrict it within each person. To this, I would only add that because the line passes through every human heart, it also passes through history, the history of human behavior on a grand scale. So the battles of the spirit are between good and evil. And whether it is just in the individual's heart or otherwise, there is this line. The notion of a spiritual dimension to the exercise of power is not new, nor is it exclusive to those who believe in God. In 1888, in his famous book, Ecce Homo, Friedrich Nietzsche wrote the following quote. For when truth engages in a struggle with the falsehood of ages, we must expect shocks and a series of earthquakes with a rearrangement of hills and valleys, such as has never yet been dreamed of. The concept of politics is thus raised bodily into the realm of spiritual warfare. And there's a straight line from Nietzsche to Hitler, if you trace through the history of that type of thinking. This conclusion that politics is a struggle between truth and falsehood, good and evil, and is a matter of spiritual warfare, is at the heart of my thesis. It is very interesting to note that while Nietzsche was an atheist, he nevertheless recognized that there could be a spiritual dimension, unseen and supernatural. In more recent times, Václav Havel said in an address in Tokyo, 1992. When I look around the world today, I feel strongly that the contemporary politics, that, that contemporary politics needs a new impulse, one that would add a broadly needed spiritual dimension. There is, of course, the alternative view that seeks to reduce the nature of power to its more elemental, two-dimensional aspects. Such a view is epitomized by Mao Zedong's famous dictum that, quote, political power goes out of the barrel of a gun. Or Stalin, mocking quip in 1935, when urged to take a conciliatory view of Catholicism in Russia, said, the Pope, and how many divisions does he have? This is not to say that Mao and Stalin did not exercise great power. But the power is not simply the capacity to enforce one's will. To believe such rules out the third dimension. Nevertheless, many of our Western elites and governments do so, which has led uh, many, including the eminent sociologist Max Weber, to conclude years ago that they did not understand the role of religion or the spiritual dimension in political power and were, quote, tone deaf, unquote, to the reality of spiritual warfare in the dimension of power. Now, it's quite interesting whether or not Weber would say that today, or he can make such a blanket statement that the Western elites don't recognize this, certainly in view of what ISIS has been doing in the last year or so. So it has maybe been a shock to the West. Uh, there's a great article, by the way, in the Atlantic a couple months, a month or so ago, on exactly this point. I'll leave it there. The reality is that it is the spiritual dimension, as reflected in human nature, that drives the actions that soft and hard power take. It is the motivations of the hearts of those wielding that soft and hard power that determines 
how that power is used, and for what end, good or evil. This does not mean that the spiritual dimension of power is only present within ourselves. Yes, it exists within us as we struggle in the battle between good and evil within ourselves, within ourselves, but also exists outside, unseen and supernatural. But perhaps the most accurate and concrete description of what I'm talking about goes back almost 2,000 years, the Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this present world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The fact that Nietzsche and the, 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 the fact that Nietzsche, the atheist, and Paul, the apostle, agree that the exercise of political power has a spiritual dimension of spiritual warfare was at a minimum give you pause to think, time to reflect on the nature of the battles you are in, why you are here, what we are all involved with, what the purpose of being here is, and most importantly, what do you believe in? What is the basis of your moral and spiritual compass? I want to leave that on the table and move now to really a basic question. So what does this mean to me in New York as a 30, 40, 50 something professional in the city, which one can say the power center of America? certainly in economic terms. My answer actually is, it means everything. It is what our lives are all about. I believe it was C.S. Lewis who made the point that we are essentially spiritual beings who have a physical presence for a short period. Life is human beings. We are not essentially physical beings that have a spiritual presence for a short period, somewhere other than in our human lives. So to begin with, let me set out the context and the perspective of this, from a Christian point of view, simply listing out, we are in a broken world, good versus evil. We worship a God of creation. He loves his creation, mankind. You're created in his image. He knows our selfish nature, but he has provided a rescue plan of hope through his son, Jesus Christ. That's on the table as how God sees his creation. You live every day in the battle zone of that creation with all three dimensions individually. And whether you're aware of it or not, and sometimes one is more aware of different aspects of this at different times, but it is always there. Now, as uncertain and discouraging as the circumstances may seem in the grand sweep of history, which I've just tried to review, my underlying assumption is that our God is nevertheless the God of hope, the God of history, and he's provided the rescue plan. I often thought when I was going into the White House uh, and without even getting into the ramifications of what power means at that level was that the only way I could actually go in was say, well, I'm glad that my God is the God of history. God's in charge of history. And it didn't matter who is in power or where was in power or who dominated whom, it was still God's creation and he was in charge of history. And in the end, good will prevail over evil. If not now, in the end, in, quote, the last battle, and God will reign. But history's not yet over. And the challenge for each of us, for each of you, is how do you find the spiritual courage, the spiritual compass by which to live in this battlefield day by day? I put down two categories to just throw out ideas and then really hope we can have a discussion. First, who are we? 
who are you, what are your dreams? And then second, how do you pursue those dreams in this battlefield, or on this battlefield? Who are you? I put down four headed. Identity. What is your identity? Is it your job? Your success? Your position? What is your identity? We always hear about teenagers having identity crises. What is your identity? Second, what are your gifts? What are your talents? We're admonished to think soberly about our own abilities, but that doesn't mean to be uh, uh, overly pessimistic about your abilities. Character, how do you behave when no one's looking? And there is humility. And poor relationships, or the significance of the relationships you have. And what is the significance of your relationship with God, with Christ. Susie and I last night went to an extraordinary talk by David Brooks on this new book called The Road to Character. And it is was put it was recorded by by C SPAN and I think the Trinity Forum has it on their website. I commend you all um, to watch it. It was for over an hour, Michael Gerson responded, and I think two of the most powerful uh, lectures we've been to in a very, very long time. And I said to Scott earlier, I mix, may mix up some of his illustrations with my illustrations or vice versa. But um, it is in this area that we're talking about, which is about character, which is really at the center of what this book, that's the title, The Road to Character. I've got a lot written down. I don't think I've got time to go through those, but I want to make sure um, that uh, you, 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 reflect, you reflect on these things as Christians or see people thinking to understand, which is basically Brooks's story of the last several years of his life, and your own identity and ambitions and your own dreams. And, what you have <clears throat> in terms of your gifts. The word I was searching for earlier is false modesty is as bad as excessive pride. One interesting fact that David Brooks threw out last night was uh, what has happened to America in the last 60, 75 years? And he cited a poll that was taken first time in 1950 of 18-year-olds in America, and what percentage of them thought they were someone special, someone important? And the poll came back as 12 percent. Poll was taken much later, sometime I think 2010 or in the last few years. Same question asked of the same cohort across the country. 80% of high school kids thought they were somebody special, somebody important. There were questions on that, a very interesting discussion, and that he contrasted it with the time prior, so that at the end of the war in 1950, the country had been through the Depression, Second World War, there was a kind of dampening uh, depression it's probably not the right word, but a certain way of, uh, maybe hope coming out of it, but they've been through a very long time of hard times. And he said, the pendulum seems to have swung in the opposite direction. Further. And tonight at dinner, we were just talking with a young man about his classmates in the last five years coming out of colleges that you all went to. Uh, where there is this sense of entitlement. And uh, Brooks was making the point that 
and which is actually one point that Kissinger always worried about was the national psyche, the psyche of the nation. And there are sociologists that can give you better explanations on this than I can. But it is very interesting thing to see our society and where we are in that balance between thinking soberly of ourselves, what are the gifts we have, and then being falsely modest or being overly exuberant in what we think we're entitled to. On character, humility is probably at the center of so many other aspects of our character. True humility, though, is really based on honesty and integrity, self-awareness of our own weaknesses. I'll leave that there. Relationships. There's always been a spiritual dimension to really deep relationships. And it isn't just when you have your friends around you that those relationships uh, are real. The great illustration, and it's something I've thought about a lot in recent years, is between David and Jonathan. There comes a period when David is married to the king's daughter. He's the kind of Tom Brady of Israel. He's just killed Goliath. And he's having a great time. And he's got his, he's, he's a combination, I guess, with Butch Cassidy and Sundance and the outlaws and they're running the country, 400 mighty men of David. And uh, he's trying to get away from the king who wants to kill him, Saul, who's Jonathan's father. And they have such a bond of friendship. Jonathan goes to find David in the wood hiding and, and encourages him and as his friend. And he finds out he's kind of David's mole in the palace, so he knows what the king's going to do next. And he goes and tells David and encourages him. But then there's a really horrendous battle, and David is then caught at the end with no Jonathan and he's in the cave, and he's really in trouble. And his men are threatening to stone him. He's going to have a mutiny of his ex-cons, or convicts that are running around with him. And there's a wonderful little verse in Samuel, quote, David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I just want to put that out there so that you remember that when you don't have each other and you don't have your Tuesday evening lecture or you don't have your Friday evening get together or you don't have your Bible study, you don't have anybody remember the final analysis in the evening, it is just you and God. And that's where Christ comes in. I mean, that's the essence of Christianity, the relationship with Christ. How do you pursue these dreams? I'm going to just list these out because uh, all of them have a story and you can ask me about them, but uh, I, I want to get these on the table. It's not that I'm trying to copy McNamara, but it did wind up that I had 11 of these reflections. <laughs> but to start with, let me just say that the most frequently asked question of me at Oxford, teaching for the last, well, not for the last, but for about 25 years from 1975 to 2000 was, how does one get to work in the White House? How can I get a job in the White House? <laughs> or for that matter, you know, how do I become a CEO? Or how do I become head of my law firm? Or how do I uh, get to be the head of my department in the university? How do I, I, I? And as David Brooks has put it, there's Adam One who's saying, Here's my CV attributes and how do I get what I want. But on the other side, or what Brooks calls the eulogy virtues, what it is you hope people remember about you and what are spoken of at your funeral. So I'm going to put these out and say, um, think about them. And think about them in the context of your 
have a, you have your dream, you have your aspirations, and how is it that you feel is a proper way to run your life, to take your actions, to be, behave, to pursue your goals? Probably the most fundamental of these is actually from Ecclesiastes. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. It's really an attitude. Maybe something very small, or it may be something big. But whatever you have to do, do it to the best of your ability. Do it with all your heart. Second, prepare. There's a wonderful anonymous quote, chance favors the prepared mind. I just love that. Chance favors the prepared mind. Or to make it more down to earth, there's a great quote from Gary Player, the uh, South African professional golfer. The more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> you could almost say, when I was thinking about that, Chance favors the prepared mind. It may be that God's plans for us favor the prepared heart. I haven't worked that through. But it's not a bad thing to think everything is a chance. God has a plan. We'll come to that a little later in the verse from Jeremiah. Kissinger often in the White House would say, I'm living off my intellectual capital because I haven't got more than three and a half minutes to concentrate on which is the way it would have felt. That's true. When you're in the fighter mode, you know, the fighter pilot doesn't have time to go back and study a little bit more on how to get out of a jam in a dogfight. He's got to be prepared. So just as intellectual capital keeps you going, it's your spiritual capital that keeps you going when you face the big questions. You've got to build that up just as much as anybody in authority has to build up his skills to do the job he's being called on to do. And it may seem at the time that it's routine. It's just a, another thing you have to do day to day. And it's boring, but don't neglect it. Another way actually to look at this uh, is from a wonderful uh, Tim Keller sermon and all I can remember about it, I haven't gone back and listened to it, is him repeating right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. And it turns out he was talking about, he told the story of a man, the point being, how you're doing now determines how you work, how you're walking up to this point determines how you're gonna behave. And it's an illustration about a hit and run driver who is not making decisions the way he should and had the baggage of his past decisions. And so the night he was in the accident, he fled instead of stopping and he went to jail. And Keller's point was walking day to day in a routine means that you know what's right and wrong and you're going to react right. And it's a great little lesson to kind of ponder in your own experiences. Another lesson or reflection is the steps of the scripture. Steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. That doesn't mean you've got to be happy in every job you've had. But there is a sense in which you're in the right place. And always, uh, I always thought, Gosh, does this mean I really have to be happy washing another car when I was in the gas station or delivering more another round of papers on my paper route or all kinds of things in our life? Delight meaning what? Delight really means that you have done the job well and you've done it to the best of your ability. There's a whole book written on this we can talk about it. If you don't know about it called What Color Is My Parachute? In part, what it tries to do is match up your passions with your skills. It's called reinforced passion. And it's that satisfaction, even though the job may be boring at different points, that actually gives you the capacity to see satisfaction or realize satisfaction in what you're doing. 
I think I want to make sure you realize we're all gifted. I know we all think some people are more gifted than others, and yes, that's true. We're not all concert violinists. We aren't all Supreme Court justices. We aren't all Tom Brady's, but everybody's got talent. God's made us in his own image. He's given us different gifts. And there's a verse that I just mentioned earlier from Jeremiah. I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. That's not a prosperity gospel. That's just saying God is interested in you, where you are, and what you're doing, and in realizing your gifts. I often say to students and to my own children, just because something comes easy doesn't mean it isn't a gift. In fact, that may actually be a tip-off, that maybe it is a gift, and you better take it seriously. And I'm sure the best athletes, whoever they are, but yes, Tom Brady has great talent, but he also practices. And that is really what we're talking about here in terms of how do you live your lives out and make the most of what you have. Another one, the next one I have written down, the value of loyalty and trust. It's a long story, but basically, I still remember when Kissinger called me and I was downtown in the law firm at Milbank Tweed, and he said, I want you to come to the White House because I can trust you. And to be honest, I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> but, I learned, obviously, over the next few years what he meant. But it, we hadn't worked that much together. We were both working together for uh, Governor Rockefeller, who was then deciding to run for the presidency. But I suppose he somehow took a measurement and said, uh, I was serious. I was trying to do the best I could in any job I was given, however menial it was. And that meant something. The great story of the Times with Kissinger when I would not get done what he wanted done in the next 30 seconds. And uh, he'd go in his office and say, did you get it done? He'd come out and I'd say, no, I haven't. And then uh, learn to absorb the wrath, the explosion <laughs> following. But then he came out two minutes later did you get it done? Yes, it got done. But the fact that I was willing to take the abuse for telling the truth made that when uh, knowing the truth was so critical that that gave me the credibility of being my yes was yes and my no was no no matter what happened. So he actually knew what was happening. And I, I look back at that, I just did it instinctively. When I look back at that as kind of being a major uh, building block or part of the foundation of the relationship with him over all these years. Trust your instincts. Have a moral framework. We all know what's right and wrong. Every time you look back at something, you say, gee, I didn't realize. I, I knew I didn't feel comfortable with that. God's given us a conscience. That's why he's given us a conscience, your instincts. And usually you don't have time to think about it. You haven't got time to balance out the pluses and minuses. You know whether these things are right or wrong. Aside in David Brooks last night, one of his favorite uh, questions in an interview which a friend told him about, was when he asked the person he's interviewing, when have you told the truth, knowing it would hurt you? That goes to this same point. You know what's right. Next point. Diligent. Be diligent in all things. Not just, I'm waiting for the big decision, in the small things. Those who are faithful in the small will be given much. I mean, it's that simple. And the people you're serving and working with will recognize that. And that is really what uh, uh, builds the relationship. And that's, I can tell you, I can walk around my firm and I can tell you the people that I think are going to do something and those who aren't. 
even to the point of how good a job they do Xeroxing the last 10 pages. It's very simple things that are indicative of much bigger things in your own character. And, and that I've learned just by watching the people and, and running our firm. Be careful of uh, peer pressure, political correctness, group think. It's a very tricky area to get into, but people get intimidated by peer pressure. And I, I, I think there's times and a very important thing for people to be able to step back. It was actually one of the big lessons to me as an American going to Oxford for the first time in 1961, having gone to my 50th reunion a couple of years ago, I couldn't believe how old everybody had gotten. <laughs> uh, I remember thinking at the time, this is interesting, there was much less of a sense of a, uh, a consensus center of thinking and a much broader spectrum in the European context. I don't know if that everybody's experienced it just mine, but it was something that stuck with me. Next, don't be in a hurry. We have a little theory in our family called the pyramid theory of life. Life is like a pyramid. You can only build it as high as you make the base wide. Don't be in a hurry to get up that pyramid. Keep working on the base, especially young people. I can't tell you how many students in Oxford that I've sent um, on the Trans-Siberian Railway or driving a school bus in Zimbabwe or working for some NGO in Argentina. And I was always telling them, get out of the country, find out about, about the third world, make sure you broaden that base, and that'll make a difference somewhere along the line. And for Christians, if you go back to Jeremiah, all these things benefit together. In the good times, remember the hard times. And in the hard times, remember the good times. That's not saying do everything in the middle. We, we are uh, commended to do everything in moderation. And that maybe is another way of saying the same thing. But life is full of ups and downs. I gave a talk a little while ago titled Triumph and Disaster, and there's an opening line in uh, Kipling's poem, If, and it's actually written over the doorway as you enter the center court at Wimbledon for the English tennis championships. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, and you all know the end line You'll just the world and everything that's in it, and what is more, you'll be a man, my son. So, let me leave it there and just say, people often also want to say, what is God's will in my life? And I had never realized it, but there is a verse that says, this is God's will for your life. And it actually is not, three, is not a bad three markers to put out there. Rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ for your life. Giving thanks, praying continually, rejoicing. My story is the story of the grace of God. Each of your stories is the story of the grace of God. I had a little diary during the hard days of building Analytica, and whenever I'd have an argument with God, on why I was in such a jam, I'd have this um, dialogue, which was God, or my version of God talking to me as if he was talking to the children of Israel. Didn't I get you out of Egypt? Didn't I part the Red Sea? Didn't I feed you in the wilderness? Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I? And in a way, I then applied that on the journey I had been on with the firm. And it's the same in your lives. The wall had closed goals. Didn't God deserve it? That's the grace of God. Don't forget it. And you all have your own list, and it's not a bad thing to reflect on that once in a while. Psalm 121, 
sums up really what I've been trying to get across. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. For a long time I didn't quite get what does he mean you're going out and you're coming in. And then I realized it's just the metaphor. Every day we go out and we come in. Every week we go out we come in. Every month, every year. Our whole lives are going out, coming in. And to know that God will preserve us through all our days in that picture is not a bad way to look at it. So be the person you were made to be. And that's all that matters. A matter of character, not of accomplishment. Be the person you were made to be. And that's all a matter of character, not of accomplishment. Thank you very much. <laughs>